Franz Josef Almeyer, welcome to Radio Wolf. I'm very happy to talk to you. Thank you. Good to be here again, Thomas. And it's my honor and privilege to share this space with you again. I hear you are in Guatemala right now. Yes, I am in the highlands of Guatemala, surrounded by volcanoes, uh, 2,600 meters above sea level in a truly magical place of the planet. And you have an interesting uh, background. You are half Austrian, half uh, Guatemala, Guatemalan, and you kind of uh, connected to both cultures. Is that true? Yeah, you can consider myself a global citizen and my cultural roots are Guatemala and Austria. And these are, you know, at times very contrasting parts of the world, but at the same time, they can be very complementary. And uh, in terms of, of money, they also give me uh, very complementary perspectives. You know, I think we were speaking in our other session about, for example, how the Mayas have seen money uh, in this part of the world. And we also at another time talked about how, for example, in in Kimse or in Tirol, some also in strong innovations around money were discovered. So I think that also gives me a sort of launch pad to, to really understand what money is and really find it in different ways. So you're already touching on it. We came to learn to know each other in the context of the last issue of our print magazine, Evolve, uh, which is in German language, where we uh, uh, made an issue about what we call the new networks, DAOs, deliver, uh, decentralized autonomous organizations, and token economy. And you are someone who really tries to connect this new technological horizont that we are in right now. There's something happening in the technological scene. And as far as I understand and what I heard from you, you see in that not just something, let's say a new way to make money or a new way to organize economy in in a more efficient way, but you see that also in a new way to create communal relationships and autonomous cooperative forms of um, living together on this planet. So we thought this is interesting. And in fact, we had an inter interview, uh, which is in the magazine, unfortunately, just in German. Uh, but uh, that's the reason why we have you here also on uh, Radio, Radio Wolf, now international edition. Tell me, what is DAO? What is token economy? And why is this exciting for someone who is interested in collaboration, consciousness culture, deep ecology? Why uh, or how do these two spheres meet and uh, is there synergy between them? Great question, yeah, and absolutely. You know, I think at the very core of this discussion is, you know, I see that the, the true promise of, of technology is the, the potential to restore the values and modalities that have been eroded across time. And, you know, right now, as you were mentioning, I think as, as humanity that is induced in a paradigm of artificial scarcity through our monetary systems, we forget what the real values are, but you know the true value of of our communities are can be boiled down to you know the people, the community that we share, but also the soil, the the biodiversity, diversity both terms in terms of of nature, but also in terms of culture. These are things that are essentially invaluable. But today, uh, in this system as that we're placed, we we forget what those values are and overemphasize, you know, monetary value. But we're also at the stage of our human evolution where a lot of us are recognizing that, you know, until the last tree is cut, until the last water is poisoned, we we realize that we cannot eat money. So that comes the the push to really see, okay, how can what is more valuable and how can we create systems that allow us to, in essence internalize those externalities in economical terms. You know, we have 
massive externalities. We have ecosystem collapse around the world. We have uh, human beings that are in constant state of depression. We have this crisis of meaning, essentially. But at the core of it is, okay, how can we do that? And that's exactly what these technologies allow us to do. You know, first of all, through the token economy, uh, it allows us to internalize those externalities and allows groups of people with shared values to join hands, to join forces in economical, but also human terms to, to create the outcomes in which each people are aligned towards. And yeah, that's, for example, the DAO component, a decentralized autonomous organization, or another way to say it is, you know, a digital venture cooperative for digitally native uh, groups of people that allow us to connect around the same values and give values to this um, forms of capital that go beyond financial capital. How do we give value to, to a forest? How do we give value to a nurturing mother? How do we give value to spiritual capital? With these tools, you know, groups of people can now come together and and sort of enable new economies that uh, can compete models built in degeneration. And that's what the core of these tools enable us to do. Allow me to, uh, to kind of confront you with uh, my uh, uh, simple understanding of what's going on here. Uh, uh, as I, uh, I, I just heard about it a couple of months ago. And I, of course, in doing this magazine, I, I, I learned a lot, uh, but still uh, I have a kind of a very uh, slim understanding of this. But why I think this is maybe interesting um, is because, uh, and please correct me if this is kind of wrong or naive or whatever, uh, what is possible here is a new version of old uh, vi visionary ideas. One visionary idea is uh, working together in corporations, uh, something that uh, people tried uh, through the centuries again and again, and uh, uh, there were always areas that is worked well, but in, in general, it was over sidelined, this kind of cooperative way of working and living together, that's one hand. The, the other is something that at least you mentioned it, uh, um, that there are the ideas to have different ways of dealing with money. It's not uh, dependent on um, the big banks, but that where money can allows us to represent a value system that a community can create within its own boundaries, let's put it in, in, in that way. And when we talk about DAOs and uh, blockchain technology, and that's basically what we are talking about in a technological sense. What, what we all are thinking about right, uh, mostly, I would say, is blockchain, uh, is a, a, um, cryptocurrency. Is, um, what's the cryptocurrency? I'm, I'm, everyone is talking about right now? There's multiple, but uh, sort of like the grandfather of cryptocurrencies, which paid a, a wave for a lot of things we're doing is Bitcoin. Bitcoin. I was uh, uh, kind of passing out under the Bitcoin. Uh, and Bitcoin is not necessarily something that many people have a good, uh, a, a good feeling about. Besides uh, the ones who speculate on Bitcoin and make a lot of money, like betting on Bitcoin. Uh, and it sounds like a new version of casino capitalism uh, on steroids in that sense. But the point that I, I understand also from the conversation with you is uh, what blockchain can do uh, is in a de decentralized ways, it can make money intelligent. You can put values in the token and money is a form of token uh, that uh, kind of represents more than just a purchase value, but uh, let's say I value that things are regional. I value that uh, things are socially balanced because 
the capacity of programming this in a blockchain technology without going into what blockchain technology exactly does. But what it does, it allow, allows a decentralized field where this value system can live and not be penetrated through any other big player in that. So it allows a field where we exchange according to a certain set of values that we kind of uh, cohere around. And that allows an independence from big banking. And it also allows, which I find as important, an independence in the digital reality that we are living right now, an independence from the algorithm uh, that are programmed by the big uh, digital companies like Google, Facebook, uh, Apple, that basically uh, program their own value system in every, in every item that we use in a digital way. So the utopia, if you may say so, is that it allows a new form of cooperative working together based on exchange systems where we, you have token and a kind of an alternative money that represents a value system that we agree on that is strong enough to hold its own boundaries and be not penetrated by other big players to allow a different way of culture to stay alive in a global reality that is completely dominated by big banks and the big data companies. So that's something that's at least interesting. So this is kind of where I find what you are trying to do with your company. Haifa, we want to talk about more and a certain form of cryptocurrency, which you call seeds, uh, to work in a way that is socially ecological conscious. Um, what do you think about this kind of uh, way I try to lay it out for a lay person of what this whole field is about? Yeah, uh, it definitely resonates. And you know, I think one sort of topic that encapsulates uh, a lot of what you're saying is, you know, the layer of trust. Mm -hmm. Trust, 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 trust is at the core of 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 blockchain, essentially. You know, um, I think throughout the history, a lot of um, sort of this degenerative agendas that are kind of uh, ruling the paradigm right now have been operating in this concept of information asymmetry. You know, like for example, cash or banking. You know, you can leverage those funds, but you know, where do they come from? What are the intermediaries? How that money is created? Who controls that money? How that money is distributed is ultimately not in the hands of 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 the citizens of the of the vast majority of the world. It's in the hand of a very concentrated individuals that might not have the best intentions or might not understand how all of these things are interconnected. And here comes blockchain, where you know you don't necessarily have to to believe uh, what a central institution told you. You know, in the aspect of blockchain, you can really transparently, immutably, uncensorable uh, create this peer-to-peer -peer exchange that allows groups of people to value what they value and opt in to different systems that match their value systems. So essentially. At the core of this is also the, the concept of, you know, throughout history, we've created a culture of middlemen that if you want to do something, you have to kind of pay tribute to a series of people that are kind of profiting from every move that you make, similar to what you were saying around, you know, the centralized institutions where it's right now in the data field, whether it's the Googles, whether it's the Facebooks, there's a, there's a number that they say, you know, that from every Facebook profile out there, Facebook makes makes thirty five thousand dollars a year. That thirty five thousand dollars could be yours because it's actually your information that they're reselling to others. But here comes blockchain technology. Now with these technologies, you are the sovereign holder of your own data, and you can monetize it if you wish, or you can decide to keep it as private. But the ecosystems that you engage in allow you to do that in a way that is fully yours under your control, not under the uh, possession of any other outside entity. And if you extrapolate that to groups of people that are aligned around shared purpose, you can really create new economical, new economies and new forms of governance that are 
scalable. And that's also something that gives me hope in terms of the paradigm that we're in, that we can really come together as, as people and and take the steering wheel of Spaceship Earth into the direction that benefits everyone. How can we do that? Because, um, of course, uh, uh, I see uh, what you're saying, and I, I started in the same way. We can create a lot of good intentions and create DAOs about good intentions. But we, you also can create DAOs around something different. You, you can create a mafia DAO, and uh, there will be, let's say, a competition of DAOs. Uh, and how? How and why do we think? If 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 we see this kind of uh, unfolding field of reality, that I I'm certain will come. That blockchain creates this kind of di digital defined fields of interaction that have some kind of autonomy, and uh, different people uh, unite around around different DAOs and they have their own currency. Let's put they and and they interact according to the values, and then you let's say you you have a kind of DAOs that are very nice and peaceful, and then you have uh, mafia DAOs. Won't we then end up in a mafia DAO world where basically everything is uh, Bitcoin uh, to death and uh, the nice, uh, peaceful uh, and deep ecological DAOs as you are trying to build one are basically just an utopia that opened the way that, but gets sidelined on the way. Yeah, you know, I think well, the way you put it is very interesting. I, I believe right now, currently, we are governed by a centralized autonomous organization, whether you see it as the military industrial complex, Big Pharma, it actually operates as a centralized pyramid scheme of extraction. So that's actually the paradigm we are in, in many cases. But really, the, the beauty of this is that now we're able to do similar ways in a decentralized format where this value flows or this or this uh, value creation mechanisms are done in a fully transparent way so that gives people options you know do i continue as business as always and kind of be a victim of the systems that i've been born into or finally have alternatives to opt into a another institution where i can fully transparently see where the value flows are going how this is ecosystem government is governed, who is part of it. So that gives you really freedom of choice to really opt in to the ecosystems that resonate with your values. So that's the, the innovation, you know, you, you don't, you're able to operate in systems where, where you're not just believing in a central entity for what they say, taking it for a face cover, you can actually verify who, how, these values are going and how they're operating. So that gives you just freedom of choice to, to, to sort of navigate wherever you see most value. So that that's the core of it. No, that's very that's very interesting. Basically, if I understand your argument, you're saying two things. Uh, we are already living in a certain world that is dominated by certain players, and at least what this new technological. Uh, capacity blockchain can do, it can create spheres of, of autonomy. That uh, means there is in a new way choice because right now uh, we are living in a fiat money system that's created by central banks uh, uh, in, in with Wall Street values. And basically uh, that's it. Uh, even democratic uh, elected governments cannot do anything against that because the, the the balance of uh, of powers already changed. That uh, it's not the government who governs the banks, but it's the banks who really have the upper hand in many of the questions how governments can govern. So we, we we are living in this reality already. So that's one thing that you say yes, uh, but we can create autonomy. And then the second part uh, of of how I understand your argument, uh, and I would say this is, is a spiritual argument, uh, uh, you believe uh, in the human spirit, uh, and when there are capacities for choice, that at least there are spheres 
where we inspire to live uh, to our deepest values. And at least there's a higher chance for these deepest values to uh, proliferate uh, in a way where there are options. And in that sense, what is happening right now is a real chance. It's not a guarantee for anything, but there's a real chance that uh, the human spirit can flourish again through new forms of autonomy. Yes. So one way to rephrase what you're saying and what we're saying or to make it more accessible, essentially there has been a monopoly on money. Mm -hmm. A monopoly on money that is controlled by a handful of people, whether you know it's whether it's a government or a central bank or you know the World Bank, where that monopoly of money creation and distribution has left the vast majority of the world with not a single option. So, so that kind of if you have a monopoly of money, you also have a monoculture of what that intention of the money has, and the whole new paradigm of what blockchain is bringing about is a uh, multiplicity of of allowing groups of people to break that monopoly and allow uh, groups of people to cohere around different values and of course there's also a multiplicity of of ways that these blockchains are implemented and i would say you know 90 percent of all the things are out there are actually a replication out of these centralized systems in order to simply create more money. But there's also a growing awareness that, you know, communities that have a certain coherence, now they're able to really value the things they stand for and create mediums of exchange without intermediaries that allow them to achieve these purposes that they set as a community. And also important to mention there is that, you know, traditionally, for example, you can see it in indigenous communities around the world where they have not had access to money and they've preserved their culture for being almost outsiders of this financial system. But the really exciting thing is that, you know, now through a digital medium of exchange that is able to reflect people's values, that access to demonopolizing money around the world has become a accessible reality for many, many parts of the world, essentially the whole planet now, where anyone in the world with a mobile phone and access to internet can opt in to the monetary systems that better align to their values. And if you give value, for example, the universality of humanity, where you know we might have different cultures, but we all have the same needs. And if you say, look, we all need food, we all need water, we all need fresh air, and you put an economy that reflects that reality, all of a sudden you've unleashed the biggest economy of the world Mm -hmm. And that's the, the very exciting thing with the technologies that allow people to find the spaces of coherence. Mm -hmm. uh, let's uh, talk about a concrete example. And with this concrete example, I mean your own company, Hyfer. Uh, you're trying to create a DAO. What are you doing? What are you attempting to achieve? And where do you see results? Yeah, we're not just attempting to create a DAO. We've been operating a DAO for the last three years. And and the way we've been doing it is essentially, you know, uh, creating a startup organization with decentralized teams around the world. We've already successfully raised funding and set up shareholder agreements with people who are investing. But more than that, you know, we're also um, transitioning away from uh, scarcity of financial resources in which we can actually generate digital tokens that allow us to honor contributions in multiple forms of capital into a alignment of purpose that this DAO has embedded. But at the same time, you know, it's very exciting because, for example, for onboarding new talent, which can usually be a slow contractual process, now these technologies are, allow you to do it almost in an automatic way where, you know, value goes in uh, value in terms of monetary value or tokens are remunerated or reciprocated. At the same time, all of the value flows in a DAO ecosystem are transparency, are full transparent in terms of where the funds are going, how those funds are governed and distributed. So that also uh, attracts more investors because they can see the whole evolution of a process and they can see how efficient we are by at using this how uh, using this money in terms of how the funds are spent. So, you know, the core elements of what 
the DAO technology enables are really transparent organizational governance, essentially through democratic voting on key new initiatives, for example, on different hires, how do you hire people, how do you make decisions for the operation of the organization. All of this is actually registered in the DAO technology on the blockchain. At the same time, you can easily set up and maintain a treasury where you know every member has perhaps a voice in terms of how the treasury is used. So it also builds trust and allows more people to aggregate because they can see exactly how the flows are going, how the decisions are made. But at the same time, one key element is that you know we're reducing overheads. So you're reducing startup and new membership costs because all of this is almost done in an automated way. But at the same time, you're also able to contribute uh, uh, or account for contributions in multiple forms of capital over time based on actual real involvement. So you don't have this sort of um, phenomenon in companies, you know, where you have people who are just there for for filling a role. You're actually really incentivizing people who are there to contribute because all of that, you know, it goes in terms of proof of contribution. And all of that has huge advantages. If one uh, uh, applies a cynic, cynical perspective on that, or, uh, one can say, oh, I understand. They just find a new clever way how to uh, gain investors and create a, a new slick way of making money. Uh, as I know what you're doing and from our conversation, uh, this seems to be not the point of what you're doing. Uh, why uh, do you think that DAOs uh, help to uh, do business and uh, in general uh, social cooperation in a way that is good for the humans and good for the planet? Yeah, I think I mentioned already in the previous, but it comes all about transparency. It's all, mm -hmm. it's all about trust. It's all about aligning um, financial incentives with with the proper outcomes in terms of purpose. So what we're doing is be able to align the best outcome of an organization with the financial incentives in a way that is almost seamless. So no contradictions in that. And at the same time, you know, we're, we are in a world where uh, anyone, any bank account can be shot out you know, these technologies are uncensorable. These are, we're talking about open source software. So essentially bits of information flying to the hyperspace that en enable anyone to contribute with their gifts into a ecosystem that is able to receive that. Mm -hmm. So that really breaks that paradigm of, you know, having to sell your gifts into a market rather than actually how do you contribute to a more meaningful way where you know that those contributions are being reciprocated fully transparent. Let me tell you how I understand what you're saying. Uh, the argument, as I understand it, is there are two factors. Uh, one is transparency and the other is trust. There is, uh, because of this technology, uh, blockchain, you can create a structure that basically you can put out, this is the organization that we want to create for that purpose, with that values. And you put all that in a non-corruptible sphere in blockchain where things are set in stone because it's very obvious, it's very transparent how this is done. And you cannot kind of corrupt that because it's programmed in a way that is fixed. So people can choose that this DAO is interesting. This DAO really uh, wants to do something that I align with. And at the same time, uh, because of the technology, one can see with the transparency that what is done really matches what is put out on the surface, what, what people say the organization does. And if this is part of the, uh, the construction of the DAO, people can also participate in the choices of that. So there is a, this is a trust structure that is built into technology and that allows uh, to create autonomous spheres of a DAO that 
where people can align for a certain purpose. It can be uh, whatever purpose, uh, but also ecological, uh, social, or human. Uh, and where, yes, let's do this together. Let's make it in a way sustainable. And because of the technological possibility to hold this autonomous structure in, in a, in a non-corruptible way, uh, people can go with it because they can trust it. And this is the novelty. Uh, th this is what the technology does. The technology does not anything else than create stability for a sphere of trust. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. This is a good summary. And, you know, another way to say it in terms of the innovation of what this technology is, is for the first time in, in human history, we can do uh, digital institutions. Mm -hmm. So it's actually a group of people working together for a common goal in which this common goals and the way that an organization operates is in a fully transparent and open way. And so therefore, what you're enabling these institutions to do in an open global market is to actually compete for members because it's also economical. You know, the more value in into an ecosystem, the more economical value you are creating and that economical value is being shared by all the members. Mm -hmm. So what you're actually enabling at a, in a global marketplace is a, a healthy competition in which human beings now have options do I want to operate in the, in business as usual, where my gifts or my humanity gets valued in US dollars and in terms of how much uh, time of my life I'm giving to a corporation, or or now entering an institution where I'm actually being more valued and have more voice into an ecosystem that I inhabit. And when you compare both, then obviously then people want to gravitate towards more democratically where they're humanity has been more valued, you have more value into the ecosystem, and you also have a voice into the evolution of that institution that you're a part of, which you wouldn't otherwise have at all in, in, in the paradigm that I feel we're living behind. That really highlights also uh, one part that, uh, that, that struck me before, that um, it is, I called it uh, the spiritual part of it, but you also can call it the democratic part of it. Because I, I I made this caricature where I said uh, there can be this 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 DAOs of the nice people and there can be mafia DAO and then basically and that's true uh, the, the, but basically the trust that that you are uh, bringing here is not dissimilar from the trust that we have in a democratic society because out of the same uh, with the same argument you could say wait a moment if everyone can wait uh, can can vote. Uh, or uh, maybe people vote for Hitler, and we know that happened. So the, 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 the danger is real, but it is, you can call it a spiritual trust in the nature of humanity, that democracy, uh, uh, if it's done right, most often works out to develop our human values. So there is a deep trust in us as humans to be democratic. And not say no. We need the good dictator who basically does the right choices for us. Because if we would vote, the danger is that uh, uh, the danger is there. But there is uh, the, in the democratic spirit, there is a trust in our humanness. And yes, I understand you. Uh, the choices that these new autonomous spheres of the DAOs create with this new blockchain technology is a similar trust in our human nature that. Basically, our aspirations have a chance to prevail, and uh, that our our human uh, inspiration is in the end not uh, something that really uh, uh, goes uh, down the drain, but is something that uh, that uh, lets us evolve as humans. Yeah, yeah, you could call it also game theory. You know, it's um, what the core of this is. You know, we know that humans collaborating for a shared purpose or a shared cause is um, is much more favorable when, than where they're competing against each other uh, for artificially scarce resources in this uh, monopoly of the DAOs that we live in when it comes to, for example, nation states or corporations, where, for example, we might be voting, but at the most part in this default 
uh, centralized autonomous organizations, which might be, for example, a nation state. Um, it thrives on having humans be complacent to the system. You know, it's like, okay, you vote for whatever illusion of choice you might have, but it actually, does it impact in terms of, you know, really economical shifts or really groundbreaking transformation? But in the DAO world, you're actually creating sovereign human beings that are actually playing in an equal field that know in order to bring about an outcome, you're about, you have to have that dialogue, you have to have a hard conversation. And what the DAO does is really create this sort of open sandbox where we know how an organization is run, where the values of those organizations is run, you know, where you have, for example, a fully transparent treasury, and you also have a voice to that. So you're not just voting in terms of who governs me, you're actually voting in terms of anything. Any human being can sort of suggest a policy. Uh, any human being can suggest, you know, how members are remunerated and if it has enough buying and if it's an idea that has true purpose and impact, then other members will very likely see it, which is not really possible in, in, in the systems that we live in. You know, there's so many ideas and so brilliant concepts, but where you actually see change happening is very limited. Mm -hmm. One argument uh, that I hear uh, that is brought against the whole idea and vision of DAOs is that one of the, 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 the main uh, diseases of our a modernist capitalist culture is the commodification of everything. That uh, whatever our life, uh, it used to be that we live together in communities and tribes and traditions and we, we had communal decisions. Of course, uh, we also had a kind of rulers and emperors and all of that, but there were the, uh, the, on the foundation there, there, there was community and uh, dialogical spheres of community, but now everything is commodified. Uh, we, uh, one friend of, of my put it that way, uh, we don't have friends anymore, we have psychotherapists. You, uh, everything uh, becomes uh, a, a, in a transactional form and that's kind of the, the argument against DAO. What this suggests is that any kind of transaction uh, in the system of DAO becomes again okay with alternative currencies but transactional. There's nothing where we have a communal uh, living for something that's our shared spirit or ethos but basically we create even more so than we have right now a transactional com commodified uh, society that basically makes everything just a commodity, commodity. Is this true or would you say that's not? Um, I can't speak for all DAOs, but I can tell you there's definitely some DAOs out there that kind of reflect that, you know. Uh, we are very different in the whole DAO ecosystem. You know, you know we're actually moving away from this concept of autonomy of autonomous organizations that are trying to automate the human element out of the equation we actually have a dho decentralized human organizations mm -hmm. where the core of it is actually to come back to community to to allow communities built on purpose to create their own mechanisms of how to value something and you know that also opens up a whole set of ways of that go beyond transaction you know it's for example here in guatemala um, where you have indigenous communities that have been using collaborative decision making for centuries and still do are already fully in resonance with this technologies because it's actually the same model just amplified through these technologies and you can also have different ways to remunerate that are not transactional for example when we've had uh, multi-stakeholder processes in indigenous communities and we've asked them okay what for, for example what roles have been lost uh in the in the fiat world in this modernization of of the planet and you know the answers are very interesting for example spiritual leaders here you have the concept of achik, which are the the spiritual elders that currently are in a in a state of of cultural loss because you know they have a gift that they want to give to their community for free and this is something that shouldn't be transactional but what we're able to do now with these technologies and is, for example, say, 
look, we have a role of a community and we can actually have a universal earned income for, for these groups of people to automatically be honored for their contributions and not having to go around trying to sell something that shouldn't be sold in the first place. Mm-hmm. So it really opens up the doors for really rewarding ways, rewarding people's contributions in ways that are not necessarily transactional, but are already honored. So that's at the core of the DAOs that we have, you know, it's um, mm-hmm. how do you design systems where these things that are sacred are kept sacred and actually you can empower that sacredness even forward and actually have that sacredness be a place of coherence that allows more people to have this positive uh, feedback loops where at the core of it is a reminder that, you know, the ultimate technology is the human being. It's not the technology itself. You know, this technology only allows us to organize across scale and break that monopoly of money that we have been limited with. So it really uh, opens up the possibilities. And that's what's really exciting about these technologies. So if I understand you right, you're saying, uh, yes, the danger is there. And there are a lot of DAOs that basically also go with the temptation to try to program everything, to automatize everything. And that, of course, creates this fear where we, as humans, and our interactions become just an adjunct of an automatized, autom- automatized process of uh, some technology. But that's not necessarily what has to happen. And this could be also kind of a, a first kind of uh, over-enthusiastic uh, engagement with technology, which shows its own shadow side. And what you are trying to do is to, to, to see that and see the fact that you program this DAO sphere, these tokens, does not mean that you have to ignore the human sphere. In fact, you can program in a way that has exactly respect for the dialogical process, respect for what has to happen between us in the emergent uh, process of finding solutions together to create a relationship. So, we can do with technology something that has respect for exactly what indigenous cultures always did, find communal dialogical ways of finding decision together. It's our consciousness that determines that. And our consciousness can put this into the structure, into the, in, in, into the uh, hardware of a program sphere, And in that, our human relationships can live in a new way if we program it in the right way. Yes, absolutely. The dialogical component is at the very core of this. You know, this is where the the true essence of bringing alignment in humanity comes to be. And if you're able to then amplify that core essence and integrate perhaps this fragmented little pieces of the puzzle that have been preserving this autonomy all of a sudden then you you're able to to expand that dialogue and now with these technologies at a planetary level and this is exactly what also competes with this uh, paradigms of of more control more centralization and do it in an open free market where then people then have the choice do i want to go continue business as usual where i'm going to become an automaton and i can just be you know, paid for being complacent forevermore and probably have a VR goggle that is sort of keeping me in an illusion of of goodness? Or can I actually go back to the roots and contribute to a more meaningful world? And, you know, I think if you really bring that clarity of options to the average person, I, I, I really hope that, you know, most people choose for the ecosystem that the humanity of them is more valued in that autonomy and that sovereignty is more valued and that's the sort of tools that we're bringing you know to kind of give people alternatives to to organize and to um, accelerate decentralized coordination and collaboration at scale great Franz Josef as we're coming to the end of our time is there still something missing in this conversation from your perspective um no just uh, maybe kind of uh giving a little bit more of a of a understanding in terms of the scope and scale that one can use this tool you know it 
it goes for like, for example, business. So you can be more efficient as a business to use a decentralized autonomous organization, but that also fits towards, you know, a village, whether it's a city, whether it's a farm, whether it's a cooperative or essentially a movement. Um, these tools allow new types of economic systems to take form. And, you know, at the core of what we're doing is providing the tools so that this multiplicity of communities can organize themselves in a way that is flexible, in a way that it's fully transparent, and that also fits your style of governance to, to essentially achieve your goals that you have set out as a community and do it in a way that is uncensorable, immutable, and essentially globally scalable. Cool. Maybe as a very last thing, where can people find you? Where can people find your work if they are interested to look? Yeah, um, I could be happy to share um, my contact details, but also you see our, our websites, haifa.earth or joinseeds.earth. But if you just uh, Google my name, you can find me in multiple uh, networks as well. So feel free to reach out and ask any questions, and we're here to serve your purpose. Hans Josef. Thank you so much for this conversation. Thank you, Thomas. It's my pleasure. Anytime.